It's, uh, it's about our, uh, our start time and uh, just a few of us, as happens in summer times, because people go away, especially this year. There has been just a mass you know, evacuation of, uh, of areas simply because people didn't get to go anywhere in 2020 and now they're making up for lost time. So yeah, that's fun. But welcome, glad Thank you're you. here. Glad you're here. We have an interesting class today. We're going to be um, we're going to be talking about the concept of uh, of hyperventilation as well as holding the breath. And we're going to be practicing a, a breathing practice that uh, it's called box breathing. We're going to talk about the benefits of breath holding, and then we're going to practice just this this concept of holding breath and what it's like and how to do it in a way that doesn't create stress or strain in the body. We got some nice uh, yoga for today. We're gonna do a little bit of a, a movement of the of the pelvic posture. Gonna work with our hands, a little bit of finger movements, and we're gonna work with our hips as well. And a really nice just breathing meditation, the pranayama meditation, which is a great way to uh, put yourself in a, in a mind state because breathing is just so integral to the uh, the act of uh, or going into relaxation, and reducing stress. But as we begin. I always begin with a quote that has something to do with breathing. And so this one, uh, Douglas Adams, and I'm not sure if that's the author or someone else, but here's the, uh, the quote. It says, don't spin your wheels and stress. Take a deep breath, center yourself, and make a plan. I like that. And so indeed. Uh, we should, if we're going to make a plan on how to be successful in improving our ability to uh, to breathe, to breathe deeply, to breathe to all the areas of our lungs, we will need to practice because uh, left our own devices, we breathe rather shallowly and rather rapidly. Uh, one of the reasons that hyperventilation can become a problem for us, we use a very small part of our lung structure, usually just the upper portions of the lung, and we don't fully uh, inflate the lung to its full dimensions. Thus, the tissue of the lung uh, is not completely stretched outward. It uh, it becomes less and less pliable because it's not exercised, like other parts of our body. If it's not exercised, it becomes less uh, able to stretch, and uh, and this can uh, become something that is a problem for us later in life. But at any point, we begin to uh, maximize the volume of our breath. We begin to uh, to basically facilitate our lung structure from being to be healthy and to be more pliable, which will allow more oxygen to come into our system. Um, but practice is always one of those, those things that, that makes us think that we've got to devote a lot of time. And I tell you, you're successful in your practice if you're just persistently doing the practice over the span of days versus a large amount intermittently over the span of, of, let's say, weeks. So if every day you did two to five to 10 minutes of practice, you would probably uh, do, do a lot better than the same exact amount of time, but done with more space in between. Because the repetition is what allows this to become more of a natural habit for us and something that we'll incorporate into our daily life and find that we're breathing more deeply, even when we're not practicing our breathing techniques. Now, um, it's easy to do practically anywhere, uh, although I, I would tell you that there are some places that, uh, that we would not want to practice our breathing technique. Let's say you're out and about. Um, if you're in a very dusty environment or next to a roadway or next to any place that you would think this is not high quality air, that would not be the time that I'd want to, or the place that I'd want you to practice your deep breathing. So do think about that. The environment that you're in might give you an opportunity. Uh, perhaps if you were on a beach, like what's in uh, the background of lesson, uh, and the wind was blowing in the correct directions and there was nothing offshore that was going to be hazardous to you, then that would be a great time to breathe. Or let's say you're out in nature, great time to breathe, or in your own home with the air system nicely filtered and uh, no overlay of chemicals from some cleaning project or, or whatever. So do choose your area, choose your timing very well and make sure that you're comfortable in what you're wearing, that, uh, that what you're wearing is not binding around 
the spaces that you would want to expand because that can uh, restrict your breathing and that you choose a posture that you can maintain for a comfortable period of time, be it seated, recline back in a recliner, or reclining on your side, even on your back. These are all great opportunities, but I wouldn't choose standing up unless you were very well practiced in breathing and knew that it wasn't gonna make you feel a bit lightheaded. So some deep breathing can be done with standing, but uh, wouldn't be where I would practice new breathing techniques. Okay, so let's, before we begin this uh, breath holding, let's just do a little bit of a uh, full volume air into the, 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 the structure of the diaphragm and the back of the chest especially. So whatever position you wanna be in, eyes open or closed. I just want you to relax for a moment. Notice where you are in your head. Notice how your breathing is at the moment. And after the next exhale, then begin to breathe in so that you're expanding into the belly. And it feels like the movement of the air is going down. It's wrapping around to the sides and the lower back. It's spreading into the shoulder blades and upper back and collarbones until you're just sort of almost tight with the inhale and then exhaling very, very slowly. Now we are gonna be uh, talking about counting seconds. So I want you to practice it right now while you're doing this for the next couple of minutes. I want you to count the number of seconds it's taking for you to inhale and then also to count the number of seconds it's taking for you to exhale. And whatever number it is, it's correct. Just keep breathing. When I'm doing this kind of technique, I'm always looking for just another little space, another little second, another little area of movement that I can create that will draw in more air. And when I'm making that slow exhale, I'm doing it, it's like, can I slow it down even more without feeling like I'm gasping? Can I prolong it? And then after your next complete exhale, just go back to your regular breathing. Just notice if there's any change in the way you feel, the way thoughts in your mind, the relaxation amount that you have, the stress within your body, because things tend to relax more. But I, I, I would be lying if I were to tell you that everybody experiences a deepening breath is something that causes them to completely relax. For some people, it actually can create agitation, especially if there has been chronic stress, because the act of letting go and relaxing might be interpreted as the body as, uh, as dropping the guard, and that uh, we drop the guard, then we're in more danger. So, you know, it's possible that we might have a little bit more of an agitation effect. Now, before we get into our next breathing practices, I want to talk about hyperventilation, about, you know, carbon dioxide in the body. This is found inside your notes as well, so I'm not going to go over absolutely everything in it, but Basically, just so we have the understanding that when we breathe in, we're, we're taking in certain amounts of oxygen found naturally in our environment. And when we breathe out, we're getting rid of the waste product called carbon dioxide. And that is a waste product created cellularly that as we create the, uh, the we use the oxygen in a, in a molecule of glucose from the food we eat and we create energy for the cells, the byproduct is carbon dioxide. And we get rid of that excess waste product through the way that we, uh, that we exhale. But uh, carbon dioxide is used by the body um, to stabilize the, the pH. And, uh, and it is one of the things that cues the body into exactly how rapidly we're breathing. So higher rates of carbon dioxide um, 
will cause the brain to adjust our breathing rate. And so the more frequently we will uh, need to exhale, the higher that the carbon dioxide level comes into our body. Now, um, the, the problem can be that we may breathe excessively sometimes. If we get stressed or upset, we may start to rapid breathe because of the excitement, the stress, the adrenaline in our system. And that excited breathing, if we're not using up the oxygen, creating more energy, et cetera, we're not using up that, um, we may begin to hyperventilate. And so rapid breathing is often uh, one of the things that causes hyperventilation. We, we basically um, have a low level of, of carbon dioxide and, uh, and that can be a problem. So uh, I think the uh, hyperventilation is thought of as, okay, I'm rapidly breathing. Uh, more than about 20 breaths per minute. But there's another type of hyperventilation that comes from breathing more deeply and only a little bit more rapidly than normal. So in other words, we're, we're inhaling and exhaling more deeply, but it's a slightly rap still more rapid than our body needs. And it may not be as discernible as <laughs> that kind of breathing. It's just a slower, deeper. And it, and it can become something that's a bit chronic, meaning that a person may develop a deep breath, and maybe it could become a chronic problem if I were to overly focus on breathing techniques and never come back into a regular breathing rhythm. Um, so this, this chronic hyperventilation can occur, and uh, it can feel to the person as if they are not getting enough air, that, uh, that instead of having, you know, too much uh, inhalation, exhalation, that they feel like they're they're not getting enough air. And what's really happening is that the, the level of, of carbon dioxide in the body is too low. Now, there can be other chemical imbalances or health issues that would cause the, the carbon dioxide in your body to be too low. But the symptoms of it would be that you would have a shortness of breath as if you're not getting enough air. Or that you would, you would start to feel anxious. You would you'd feel dread you know, in, in, your, in yourself, feelings of anxiety. You could feel dizziness or chest pain and your heart rate could become rapid or irregular. You could break into a sweat and there could be numbness, especially surrounding the mouth or in the fingers and muscle cramps in the hands or the feet. Now, this is not the only thing that can cause some of these symptoms. But I'm just saying that if there is a, a situation where these symptoms are occurring and they seem to be coming with some frequency and there's not another physical ailment going in the body, it could be that, the, uh, that there is a, a chronic state of hyperventilation. And the treatment for it is the same as we would do for a, you know, a level of, of rapid onset hyperventilation that I'm breathing too rapidly. I have an acute onset of hyperventilation, which is basically you pause the breathing rate so there's a greater accumulation of carbon dioxide in the body. Now, it's not gonna harm us if right now we are um, not hyperventilating. If we do some breath holding and we actually increase our, our carbon dioxide level, uh, there, there's actually some health benefits associated with that. Um, pretty much it can improve the lung function. And this also is in your notes. Uh, basically uh, allowing the body to, uh, to breathe more fully, uh, you know, causing there to be a need of greater filling of the lungs because we simply uh, were restricting and having more carbon dioxide develop. We would also uh, develop an improved tolerance to carbon dioxide. We would not feel as much uh, breathlessness related to uh, carbon dioxide. Um, there is some signs uh, more associated with, uh, with other creatures than humans of an increased lifespan. Um, in newts, there is a regeneration of brain tissue. So if you're newt, hey, good, good reason to hold your breath. Um, also, perhaps increased resistance to bacterial infect infections and also potentially an increased relaxation. So by basically increasing the carbon dioxide, by containing the breath, by not letting ourselves breathe as rapidly, um, we can actually improve some systems. So we're gonna do a little bit of, uh, of breathing. The first one, is called box breathing. And this is basically, I'll, I'll tell it to you now before we get into it, it's going to be um, exhaling four seconds, pausing four seconds, inhaling four seconds, pausing four seconds. Now, the four seconds is recommended. If you find that five seconds works better for you or six seconds works better for you, fine, or three seconds, okay? So it's basically 
there is a, a square that we're making. We're, we're creating the exact same amount of time in each aspect of this. So go ahead and get into that comfortable, relaxed position. And we're gonna do a little bit of time with this box breathing. So after you're comfortable, eyes open or closed, on your next exhale, I want you to exhale slowly and then inhale for four seconds. Pause for four seconds. Exhale for four seconds. Pause for four seconds. And then repeat the cycle. So we're creating that nice little square. Now, as I said, if four seconds is not the breathing rate that satisfies you the most, that's okay. A second up, a second down would probably be just fine. We're gonna make it a nice square. It can help to have clock ticking, but I think for most people, we're pretty good at being able to calculate four seconds. And then as you relax, go back to your normal breathing. And how was that, uh, that box breathing? Was it something that you found easy to do? Was it something that was uh, troublesome? Was four seconds the right timing for you? Remember, you don't have to necessarily answer me actively. You can just think about it for yourself. But if it did cause some issues, this would be a nice time to talk about that. Now, if we were breathing and doing this pacing, those four seconds of breathing in, four seconds pause, four seconds of breathing out, four seconds pause, that's giving us a breathing rate that's pretty slow per minute. It's about, you know, four breaths a minute. And that slows us down. Most people's respiration rate is probably closer to about six to 10 breaths per minute. And yet we're bound into that nice little squareness. Everything is the same. And I found it was uh, rather nice to be able just to say, hey, what am I, you know, have I, it's four seconds now, what am I supposed to do, inhale or exhale? Oh, that's right, I've, I've inhaled, so it's time to exhale. So that was a nice little boundary that let it be something that I could just do and not have to think about very much. So that can be a very comfortable one, especially if you are in an agitated state and you want to calm down, the box breathing can help to regulate that oxygen, carbon dioxide in the body. Now, we are, 
you know, if you find breath holding to be something intimidating or something you just don't want to do, it's perfectly fine. You can just do another round of the box breathing if you found that comfortable. But I'd like us to try and hold our breath. And I don't know um, how your childhood was, but in my childhood, I constantly, if I was watching something where, oh, I don't know, Tarzan was swimming underwater to try and uh, get somebody's leg outside of this big clam that clamped on their leg, I would be holding my breath the same as you know Tarzan to see if I would have survived that too. And during that time, I found I wasn't very good holding my breath. And in part, it might've been because I was, I was gripping, I was tightening my body in order to hold my breath. It was, you know, Tarzan was depending on me. Um, we're to be relaxed. If you're doing any of this uh, breath holding training, the more relaxed you are and the more relaxed your throat is, the better. So we're just gonna be pushing very gently. So let me explain it to you before we practice it. We are going to uh, inhale fully, counting the number of seconds that we inhale. And then we're going to hold our breath for the same amount of time as we did our inhale. And then we're just gonna exhale very slowly. But each time we inhale, and before we exhale and we hold our breath, let's say you started off, you inhaled for like six seconds, you held your breath for six seconds and then you exhaled slowly. Then the next time you breathed in for six seconds, you'd hold your breath and you would try to add on somewhere between five to 20 seconds more to that inhaled breath. It's up to you. You get to decide. And there's no wrong thing to do. We're just going to try and gradually increase the amount of time that we are comfortably without strain holding our breath before we exhale. Okay, so it's as simple as that. So I want you to get comfortable. And when you're ready to take that next deep inhale, inhale deeply and fully, but count the number of seconds that you're inhaling. You're going to hold your breath for that same amount of seconds. And when you're ready to, just exhale very slowly, very deeply. But now, again, on the return, you're going to inhale, count the number of seconds, and then hold your breath. See if you can hold your breath a little bit longer than the duration of your inhale. But when you're ready to, and when you want to, just having noted how long you held your breath, exhale. So there's no, nothing to worry about whether you are able to uh, inhale fully and hold that breath for a long duration or not. So just keep going for the next couple of minutes.
Now, if your next breath and hold after that next exhale, then just relax. Return to your normal breathing rate, but notice how you feel. You feel out of breath. Do you feel any strain in your throat? What's your state of mind? Are you more awake and aware? Are you more calm and relaxed? Were you able to hold your breath for a longer duration than you uh, created the inhale? And so overall, just notice how you're feeling. And if you want to share that information, how you feel, how this worked for you, everybody welcomes that. So I noticed that I could never slow down the inhale much, but I could hold the breath a long time and slow the exhale. But then I, the inhale was always the same. <laughs> okay. <laughs> always. All right. <laughs> You know, Mary, I experienced that too. I think I got one more second. I was kind of expecting that, you know, based on, you know, what I was talking about, that, you know, I would want to inhale more deeply. Maybe I was inhaling more for the same amount of time. I don't know. But, uh, but I didn't get anything more than just maybe one more partial extra second <laughs> onto that inhale. Um, but I did, uh, you know, I noticed something. Um, and of course, this was not part of the instruction. But I would reach that point of holding my breath and I would just want to exhale. And so the last time I did it, I let myself begin to uh, exhale ever so just a little bit and then hold and exhale a little bit more. And I got the longest duration very comfortably because it just seemed to me that my body was like, oh, you got to get something out of here. And so the act of exhaling, becoming part of that holding of the breath, um, was very comfortable that last time that I did it instead of feeling I didn't want my neck to get tight trying to hold that breath in. Very good. So if you get into a situation where you have some shortness of breath or anxiety or, or dizziness or your heart rates fast, you might just try seeing if a moment or two of, of just reducing and holding that breath momentarily will help you calm down a little bit. It might, it might not, you know, no guarantees on that, right? But could very well be that we might feel a little more relaxed. Very good. Okay, we're going to go into our actions of yoga. So I'm going to change the view here so that you'll be able to uh, more easily see what's going on. And uh, we're going to do some things. Some of it will be, I'll invite you to stand. Although remember, if you, uh, in, the, uh, in the gentle yoga exercises, if you prefer not to stand, you don't have to. We're going to be working with the structure of our pelvis. We're going to be working with our hand. We're going to be working with our hips. The first is a, um, an action of standing. So I'm going to stand where you can see me. And you may sit if you prefer. All right. So if you like, uh, come into a standing position or sit so that you're forward in the chair. Now, what we want to do is to change the curvature of our low back by tilting our pelvis. And so if we were in a very neutral pelvis posture, the aspects of the bony front and the pubic bone would be lining up with each other in the same plane. So I want you to uh, place your hands either at the top of the pelvis here or find this bony area in the front. But basically we're gonna start from the top and we're gonna have our hands a little bit forward of this line of our pelvis because I want us to create more curve in our back by tilting the pelvis gently forward. So there's gonna be an increased curvature of the lower back created from that. 
And then again, only to the degree that's comfortable. And then I want us to think about tucking under the tailbones of this top part of our pelvis is to move backward. You can bend your knees slightly if you like. So we're going to be making a pelvic tilt. When we tilt the pelvis forward, it would be a, a great idea to inhale into the belly. And when we're flattening the back and tucking the tailbone under and pulling the top of the pelvis backward, it's a good time for an exhale. So the inhale, we could say the back is arching, pelvic tilting, and the back flattening as we exhale. So this movement of our pelvis, we often stand in a posture that, that does not have this neutral line, either the front of the pelvis too far forward or the pubic bone a little too far forward, the back more flat. But creating this movement is a great way to ease tension out of this region of the lower back, the sacroiliac joint. So just creating this rather subtle back and forth movement is really great. I'll show you a moment if the, the chair version of it. We may feel a little more compressed if we were seated in a chair because we're weighting the structure of the pelvis. But the curvature of the back, pelvis tilting forward, the slight flattening of the back. So a little bit more pressure on the, uh, the lower back because of the weight of the upper body not being passed into the legs. Instead, it's just on the pelvis itself. So maybe you don't create as much movement in this seated position if you would if you were in the standing position. All right, but that's a nice one. That relieves some tension out of the low back region. I'm going to come closer to the camera right now because I'm going to ask us to do for the moment a, uh, a hand exercise. And for this one, we're going to be uh, folding the hand. It's a, it's a flexion of, of the hand. When we, uh, when we create a fold of the hand, normally we're folding, we're grabbing hold of, uh, of a thing. So we're grabbing hold of a thing. And we just tend to fold our hand in in such a way that it grabs hold of that thing. And we never really think about the way we're, we're folding in, but the, the structures of the knuckle joints each have their own muscle function. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have us create different folding actions one hand at a time. And my other hand's gonna be the assistant to this hand. So the first way I'm gonna fold things in is I'm gonna take the fingers of the hand. I'll, I'll treat the thumb differently. I'll have my hand braced across this, uh, this part of my palm. So that the only way I can bring my fingers in is to, is to just create sort of this little flat area. So I go up and I go down and I'm not trying to fold my fingers firm against that. I'm just trying to make it so that the movement is only happening in that joint area. So there to there. And when we go back, just pull back comfortably. Your fingers may not move backward at all. It's okay. And all the fingers may not react absolutely the same. So do that on one side. And then we're going to do the other side. Now, of course, I'm holding my hand up just so that you can see your hand can be relaxed in any position. So here I am with the, uh, the fingers up, the fingers in that down position. So up and down. So side two. And it may seem a little strange to uh, to keep the fingers flat when they're folding inward like that. The number of times you do it is just a very comfortable number of times. Now, next I'm going back to that first hand and I'm gonna brace so that instead of it being this low line, I'm coming up to this other knuckle region. I'm gonna fold in there's a little bit angular there. I'm going to try and make them all work at once. So that everything's folding. This, this knuckle's not. I got my thumb across the back of it. So the only thing that's folding is this secondary knuckle region. We'll try it on the second side. So again, my thumb is across the, uh, the back of that knuckle so that it cannot move. And then I'm just folding in the fingers, trying not to let the, uh, the tip of the finger go down, but you know, it may want to. All right. And then finally, we're, to get the, uh, the tip of the finger, I have to resort to just one finger at a time. So I'm just going to go to each finger and I'm going to hold and just try to bend just the tip of the finger. And then, you know, you move to the next finger. 
And you may be more capable in one finger than the other. You can see my, my ring fingers, you know, moving along with everybody else there. And then finally, the little finger. All right, and then I've got this other side. So I'll start with my index. Just the tip. And then try and isolate just so that the middle finger is the one that's moving. And then trying to isolate just the ring finger. And then finally, just a little go. All right, and then you can shake the hands out a little bit. And then we work with the, the thumb. Now the thumb has a joint right here that can move. So it's like I'm trying to grab the uh, finger with the palm of my thumb. Okay, try that on one side. Try that on the other side. So it's just the, uh, the thumb folding inward. All right. And then we're going to try and embrace everything and make the thumb bend just at that one knuckle there. And then embracing and just having it fold in at that one knuckle. And then finally up just the tip of the thumb. And then just the tip of the thumb. And then just shaking that out. It's an, it's an action. Now, one of the things I, I entertain myself doing is, uh, is placing the palms all together. Come closer to the camera there. And, uh, and then pushing with one side and pushing with the other side. Now, there may or may not be a lot of movement in your hand. So I'm pushing. So this side's sort of folding in. This other side is, is being stretched. So I'm just creating a little bit of a warping one way and the other way. As so I find myself uh, doing that when my hands are not visible sometimes, just creating this little bit of a, of a stretching action. And you will eventually feel it in your forearm region as you're creating these actions, which are both contractions of certain muscles and stretches of certain muscles. Another thing we can do is to uh, create this nice little sort of spider shape and uh, squeeze and then just get a nice little grip so all the knuckles are bent and straightened, bending. It's like a spider on a mirror kind of thing there. All right, so the more we sort of play with our hands, creating these various shapes with the fingers, the more we create that kind of uh, engagement and control over the fingers, the better it is for the nervation into the hand, the better it is for the stretching, and the hand just doesn't take on that I'm constantly used to grab things shape. So very good. Okay, next thing on the list of what I want us to do is a circling of the hip. Um, now this can be done in a uh, seated or standing position. And when I say circle the hip, while we're talking about a seated or standing position, it would be nice and stable. And you would just be taking the, the leg and just making a gentle circle with it. So you might stand beside a chair. But instead of doing this in a standing position, I'm going to come on to the side because I find that to be the most comfortable and the greatest range of motion. So if you were, say, seated in a chair, you could sort of maneuver your leg a little bit. But, you know, you're sitting on the pelvis, and so you're not going to have as much freedom. If you can come on to your side, you're going to have the greatest amount of freedom and get a really nice increase of circulation and movement to the hip. Now, your head and your shoulder can be braced by pillows or something. I, I always just prop my head up because I'm looking at the camera there. Um, so your head can be in a position that's comfortable, but I am positioned shoulder over shoulder and hip over line of hip. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this upper leg and bring it in the direction of my body. And I'm going to hold somewhere between the knee and the ankle, bringing it comfortably toward the body, comfortably higher, a little bit backward and a little bit forward. And you're going to find what position works the best for you in this circling of the hip. And so you just do it a very comfortable range of motion. Now you circle it in one direction, you can pause. But we were circling in this direction. Now I'm going to circle 
in the opposite direction. So I'll start to move the leg backward. Now, even though it's the same group of muscles that's being used, muscles are very aware of order of action. And going in one direction creates a different effect than going in the other direction. And then when you're ready to, you just relax it down. And then we're gonna do the other side. You may feel fatigue in the leg. After all, muscles are being used, but it is a great hip opener, a great way to work so that we're actually influencing uh, a greater amount of circulation into the muscles and to the joint structure of the hip. So we're gonna get on to our second side, the head and neck made comfortable. I'm stacking one knee over the other, one shoulder over the other, the hip is over the other. And our hold position is somewhere between the, uh, the knee and the ankle, wherever you find it comfortable. And we're just gonna bring the knee in the direction of the chest, lift it comfortably high, bring it comfortably back and around in a circle. And the circle could be very large or the circle could be very small, depending on the person. Um, you don't want to feel any extreme things, no, no discomfort. There could be a, a slight sensation of movement of, of tendon structure. There might be a, a little bit of a clicking, but if it's just constant clicking, you would not want that to uh, be something that you emphasize. I'll let the leg go down now. Uh, that was circling toward the chest first in this circle, and we're going to go away from the chest in the circle now. You're going to feel various muscles that are overly tight stretching, especially in the thigh region. You may feel this into the pelvic structure. It may have some effect in the lower back. But this is just a great, easy movement of the, uh, of the leg. Like I say, my, my favorite position is, is when we're on our side because I, I feel that the action of moving in a seated position just does not quite create the same amount of release potential. And the standing position, it's a bit awkward to stay upright. So, oh, I see them. Okay. Now, let's, let's prepare ourselves for our meditation. And so, I want you to find a comfortable position because we are going to be using a breathing meditation. Pranayama, the uh, practice of breathing that we've already been using to, uh, to expand our lungs, to enhance our respiratory muscles. Um, when, we, when we bring it into the realm of meditation and relaxation, it can become very profound. Um, our, our ability to notice our breathing waxes and wanes. Our ability to be conscious of the very act of something that is vital to our life. It's amazing that we can ever lose track of it, but it's probably very important that we can lose track of it too, because if all we were doing was focusing on breathing, there wouldn't be that much time for mind space for other things. But right now, your focus on your breathing is going to enhance your ability to notice the the very moment that you're in. Lizette, you had a question. Oh, you got to turn on your mic. There you, you, go. Part, you, you, you talk about our breath and noticing our breathing, but what about all the things that are tough for us to notice, such as digestion, heartbeat? I mean, any of that. That's correct. Uh, we don't have conscious control over our digestion. In other words, we cannot think, okay, let's re release this enzyme, right? Um, uh, or let's make this peristaltic action happen in our stomach. So we don't have that kind of conscious control. And with our heart rate, we don't have direct conscious control. We can increase and slow our heart rate. And some people get pretty good at a biofeedback of being able to do the things that lead to that. But our breathing, we can actually hold our breath. We can actually delay our breath. So we have both a conscious breathing state 
as well as an unconscious dreaming state. And that's what, and that was a good point that you made. So there's a lot of things, you know, I don't know what my, you know, pineal gland is doing at all times. So, you know, yes, there are other body parts, but this is one of them that we have some capacity to be both conscious and unconscious of, but that it trends toward the unconsciousness the majority of the time. And so when we take something that we can control and bring it into our conscious state of mind, it tends to embed us in the moment that we're in. Because in order to, to notice the action of breathing, you have to be psychologically as well as physically present. Because, you know, when we're unconscious, like sleeping, we're still breathing, but we're not psychologically or physically as present in that act. So I want you now. It, okay, here's the other thing I'll tell you. In the act of using pranayama breathing meditation, you may actually fall into a less conscious state. You may actually start to drift and go into the first stages of sleep. It's a very common thing, especially if you're very tired. And that is not a negative. I always tell people, if you're meditating and you fall asleep, good job. Okay, it's okay. Uh, we're often chronically under, you know, under sleeping there. Uh, our insomnia rates are pretty high. Our stress level is pretty high. We may be really tired. And so if the body takes the opportunity in the moment to say, oh, good, let's go to sleep, just let it and don't consider that a negative. Fine. Julie, Julie do you happen to know if the lack of sleep and the high stress is particular to... Uh, the United States or Americans? No, I, I would say in in my estimation of it, it is more likely perhaps in um, a more developed country simply because we disrupt the natural rhythms of our life in order to um, to go to this nine to five job or whatever it is that we're doing. Um, and so I wouldn't say that it, uh, that it would be more epidemic in the United States. Any, um, any advanced country is likely to have it. But also, I will tell you this, it's possible that in any situation, there, there is stress. You get a, uh, a non-developed or you know, a less developed country that is at war. You're going to have chronic insomnia because of the stress of living in that kind of situation. You have a, a situation where people are hungry or, or there's some other physical stress on them. They're not going to be resting peacefully. So there, there are different kinds of reasons that we might not be sleeping well. But, uh, but yeah, I would say developed countries, sure. Sure, we will, uh, we will create our own stresses because we are, uh, we're away from a natural life. And so by breathing and, and, and meditating and focusing on the moment that we're in, what's really nice about that is that that, uh, that changes the, the profile of chemistry of the brain because if we're anticipating the future, and I talk about this all the time, if we're anticipating the future and the future holds stress, we will exhibit the signs of stress currently right now. If we're remembering a past and the past holds stress, we will exhibit the signs of stress right now. So the mind surges ahead and falls behind, but the body is here and now, and every bit of what we experience is going to be created by the body. So if it thinks you need a little bit of adrenaline to deal with the thing you're thinking about, it's gonna give it to you right now. It's not gonna be able to understand that it's not happening right now. That's why a scary movie can make us jump because nothing's actually happening, but our imagination is giving us the cue. So when we take ourselves to this moment, this here, this now, we actually bring ourselves to a deeper level of calm and we rid ourselves of those chemistries. So let's do it right now. Let's, let's get comfortable. And the good news is you can be in any position. In fact, if you want to recline, that's, that's really nice. Any breathing technique is fine that you would want to use, just slow and deep. Okay, so get in a good posture that's comfortable. Begin to breathe slowly and deeply. But I want you to notice where you feel the physical reality of that breath. That when you breathe in, when you inhale, focus your mind on the sensation of the air entering your nostrils. So you're breathing in and you're feeling that air in your nose, but it's not gonna stay there. So let your mind notice the flow of the air the next time you breathe in, into the back of your throat. 
it's actually going to ricochet off the soft upper palate at the back of the throat and it will begin to swirl down the throat and it's going to reach an area of concentrated coldness right in the center of the collarbone region as the air begins to travel into the bronchial tubes. So you breathe that in and you feel that coldness right there. Now every exhale that you're creating, you're gonna feel the change of shape because when you breathe in, your ribs expand, your belly expand, your clothes may tighten up around you. That's also a part of the physical expansion, that action of breathing. But when you exhale, the pressure is going to reduce. The tightness of your clothing is going to cease. And the flow of air is going to be barely perceptible because it is now body temperature. So when you breathe in, keep your mind focused on the coolness of the breath. And when you breathe out, let your mind focus on the reduction of pressure, the relaxation, the softening of your chest and your neck, the clothes loosening around you. And then as you're breathing, slowly and gently, try and find an area of expansion that you've not explored before. Maybe it is a portion of your belly, or maybe it is the sides of your ribs. Maybe there's an area around that lowest part of your rib right next to your low back that you've not felt expand before. Maybe you're feeling a widening apart of your shoulder blades. Or maybe you're bringing that breath into your collarbone area, letting it lift up. Maybe you've decided to breathe in so completely that every part of you feels expanded, like you just can't bring any more air in. Maybe when you're exhaling, you're letting everything go soft, but you're adding a little bit of an inward pulling of the belly to get that last little bit of air you can out. Stay connected to some physical evidence of your breathing. The coolness of it, the sensation, the stretching of your body. Feel as if when you're inhaling, that it's going beyond those areas of your lungs. That somehow it's as if there's an expansion that's happening body-wide into the arms and legs, into the hands and feet, up into the top of the head, that you're just expanding. And that when you're exhaling, that that relaxation and that loss of pressure is happening, not just in the lung region, but in the hands and feet, the arms and legs, and out of the top of the head. So that you breathe in, everywhere and that you exhale from every place that every part of you is inflating in the inhale and every part of you is deflating in the exhale Now you may prefer to just stay with this and keep going with this for longer, or you may prefer to return to your normal breathing rate. Maybe you've noticed something you want to talk about in this action. Decide if you want to come out of it, you can roll your shoulders, you can move, you can wiggle, you can come out of the posture. You can just stay there in that state of mind that is you in that process of breathing slowly and deeply. Maybe you're falling asleep and you just want to go with it, and you can. 
But I want you to know you've done excellent work today. Great job getting here, practicing, doing all of this. And your body appreciates it and your mind appreciates it. So excellent, excellent work.